This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a very great uh, honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker from the University of California, uh, San Diego, um, Dr. Stephen Mayfield. Uh, Dr. Stephen Mayfield is a director of the California Center for Algae Biotechnology, and he's also co-director of the Food and Fuel for the 21st Century Research Unit, and a professor of molecular biology at UC San Diego. Dr. Mayfield, uh, following his postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Geneva, Switzerland, <clears throat> excuse me, returned to California as an assistant professor at the Scripps Research Institute, and he was the first to achieve a transformation of a green algae uh, nuclear uh, genome. He joined UC San Diego in 2009, and uh, uh, Dr. Mayfield's lab set the stage for the use of algae as a platform for recombinant protein production, including the expression of human therapeutic proteins, which led to the founding of Rincon Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Mayfield is also scientific founder of Sapphire Energy, the world's largest uh, company focused on algae-based um, uh, animal and, and human nutraceuticals. He received a BS degree in biochemistry and plant biology from Cal Poly State and a PhD in molecular genetics from UC Berkeley. Uh, please join me in welcoming a highly accomplished scientist and a tremendous innovator, and uh, Dr. Mayfield, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and what am I going to talk to you guys about? I'm going to bring, I'm really going to bring you back down to earth, <laughs> all right? And, and we're going to talk about pond scum for, for, for the next half hour. But, but actually, I, I will make the argument that um, it's the little things in life that matter, OK? And, and if we get enough of the little things right, may, maybe, we'll get, maybe we'll get some of the big things right as well. So let, let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about you know, food and fuel, OK? And then I'm going to eventually tell you some of the cool little products we make. Um, but, but why do we talk about these things together? In the, in the simplest term, you know, both are chemical energy, and that's the energy in a substance that can be released by a chemical reaction to do work, right? And all of us recognize this, that if we eat some food, this is what's going to power our body. We can go running. We can ride a bike. If we put gasoline in our car, we can drive it. So both of those are work that we can accomplish. And then we also convert between these, right? And, and I'll tell you a little more about that. You know, so, sometimes directly, I think unfortunately, is that we now take 40% of our corn crop and turn it into fuel that we blend with our gasoline. But then we also take petroleum and turn it into food. I'm convinced that Twinkies are actually a petroleum product, okay? <laughs> and you try to find the recipe for those. I have looked high and low, and you can't. So, so we clearly interconvert between those. But really importantly, and this is actually the serious message here, is that both food and fuel are the biological conversion of sunlight energy and CO2 into products, all right? And, and that's really what I want to talk to you about today. It, it's the most fundamental you know, action on the planet. It's one that is completely, I think, um, I'll, I'll say misunderstood, but mainly unappreciated, all right? Um, it's where all of our food comes from, and you'll recognize that. We take, we, we take sunlight, we take CO2 and a little bit of water, and from that we make primary sugars, and those sugars give us carbohydrates and proteins and lipids, and you clearly all recognize those as food. But you should also know that petroleum is simply fossil algae, and coal is simply fossil plants. So 85% of the energy we burn on this planet also comes from this reaction. Now, granted, that reaction was 300 or 400 million years old, but it's still photosynthesis that, that delivers all of those things to us. Okay, we also convert between these things, as I said. So an average American consumes about 2,000 or 3,000 calories per day. We also burn about 40,000 calories of gasoline per day. 
Today we take, and in fact, in last year, 40% of our corn crop in the United States was turned into 13.9 billion gallons of ethanol, which was blended in our fuel. If you go down and fill your car up today here in La Jolla, 5% of that will be ethanol from this product, from, from corn, okay? We also convert energy into food. We do that indirectly by something, you know, this is agriculture, and this is agriculture productivity over the last 50 years. And that was brought about by something called the Green Revolution. So what was the Green Revolution? The Green Revolution was an effort, primarily run by the United States, but also by many other countries, after World War II, to dramatically increase the food availability on the planet. And how did they do that? They didn't do that by increasing land use. That's the little blue line right down here. They didn't in increase farm labor. What they increased was the use of mechanical tractors, the amount of fertilizer put on, and the amount of fuel they put on. So what we did was we took really inexpensive fossil fuel and greatly increased our ability to produce food on the planet. And this process is actually what allowed us, or allows us to have 7.2 billion people on the planet today. Energy can also be looked at in a different term, and that's that not only is it responsible for our food and responsible for our cars, it's actually the biggest market on the planet, bar none, and it's growing at an incredible rate. So in, in 2010, the energy sector was $5.8 trillion. And as I said, agriculture and energy are really the same thing, and you can count also petrochemicals into that. And if you add all of those up together, it's about 70% of the commerce on this planet, right? of the actual physical material things that we trade. Just to put that in perspective, here in San Diego, we think the, the pharmaceutical industry is enormous. It's only about $650 billion total. So a fraction of what energy is. But energy is, is not only you know, in dollar terms, in, in terms of gross markets, it's also enormously important for our well-being and for how we view ourselves, right? And, and for how rich we are frankly, as a nation. So this is a really interesting plot. And what this plots is gross domestic product per person on this axis versus energy consumption on this axis. And by and large, you get, you, you get a, a pretty tight correlation. And what that says is that if you're a very rich country, here we are, the United States up here, we have a very high GDP, right? And we, we achieve that by consuming a large amount of energy, all right? Some countries are a little less effective than us. So Canada, it's a little colder up there. They, they have a little more energy. They have the tar sands, so they, they're a little less efficient than us. They burn a little more, right? So they, they don't quite have as high a GDP and burn the same amount of energy. Some countries like Japan tend not to have a lot of cars and not that much air conditioning, so they're a little more efficient than us. But by and large, if you want to increase the wealth of your nation, you are gonna do that by increasing your energy consumption. So why is that important? That's important because those two little dots right there are India and China. That is now 2.6 billion people on this planet, and those people want to have and are going to have the same economic income that we have. So how are they gonna rise from here to here? They're gonna do that by increasing their energy consumption. So an enormous pressure on energy going forward, and therefore an enormous pressure on food. And as I will explain to you, that, that's actually uh, the issue that we face. Okay, so, all right, what's the problem then? We, we pump petroleum out of the ground, we have a lot more energy, we distribute it to people, we all get richer, right? This is oil production over the last 10,000 years, okay? We didn't really start pumping this stuff out of the ground in earnest till about 1903 with the invention of the automobile and the, and the mass production of the automobile. We hit peak oil in 2007. I'll tell you in a minute about, you know, I know people, there are many people in this audience who've read, and you can read an article today that says, we haven't reached peak oil, it's gonna go on forever. We reached peak oil in 2007. Why do we continue to say we haven't? Because we simply redefine things as oil. We've now redefined the tar sands as oil, and we've in fact redefined uh, the corn ethanol that I told you about. That's a liquid fuel, so that counts as oil, right? It's quite clear that we reached peak oil. Why a 10,000 year time frame? Right? That, that's actually completely arbitrary. If I were to put this on the time frame of how long it took us to accumulate that fossil fuel, 300 million years, you wouldn't even see this line. Right? Even if I put it on the time frame of how long humans have been on the planet, 
right? Some people say a million, but certainly for the last 250,000 years, you also wouldn't see this, right? So we are gonna burn through 300 million years of accumulated hydrocarbon in about a 200 year period, about eight generations of people. This is one of the most alarming graphs that I have ever seen. And it's one that should alarm everyone in this room. It should alarm everyone on this planet. Here's what that is. Here's that same petroleum utilization in blue. And then overlaid on top of that is millions of people. This is world population, all right? And what you can see is a very nice correlation between use of cheap fossil fuel and an enormous expansion of the number of people on this planet, all right? This is actually the issue that we face today, right? Th this, is, this is front and center on everything we do, and, I, and I'll explain a little bit why now. So why is that? The reason for that is really twofold. One is, it used to be that oil was so cheap, you know, less than $20 a barrel, if you even go back 10 years for our previous history, that the component, the, the economic component of agriculture that was directly related to petroleum was a small part of that. Most of the cost in agriculture was the labor. But once petroleum costs got above $20 a barrel, that became the major component in the cost of food. And so what happened starting in about, here's 2001, so if we just go back even just 15 years, what you can see, here's the correlation between the average oil price in red and the food price index in blue. And what you can see now is that these things are beautifully overlaid on top of each other, right? That means when the price of oil goes up, the price of food is gonna go up. And the reason for that should be no surprise at all. I just showed you that we have tractors, we have fertilizer, we have energy into agriculture. We no longer have labor, right? It's now less than 2% of the labor force in the United States is involved in agriculture, all right? But that means that we're, we're completely dependent on energy. Now, all of us sitting in this room probably spend about 5 or 6% of our total income on food, all right? The bottom 2 billion people spend at least 50% of their income on food, and the bottom 1 billion people spend 70% of their income on food. So the quick math says that if 10 years ago the index was 100, and today it's above 200, and if I was spending 70% of my income 15 years ago on food, and it's now doubled, I'm spending 150% of my income on food. And what that really means is I'm not buying enough food, okay? So this is that same food price index. Here's the food price index overlaid with significant riots in the Middle East and North Africa. This is kind of a shocking graph to me when I pulled this thing off the internet a little while ago, but what it really shows is that every time the price of food spikes, there's trouble someplace in the world, and mainly in those parts of the world where they're spending 50 or 60 or 70% of their income on food. And in fact, what we refer to you know, as the Arab Spring has very little to do with democracy and a whole lot to do with that. If you look, Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, this was the beginning in 2011 of the Arab Spring. So what the Arab Spring really is, is I no longer have enough money to feed my family. That must be the fault of the government. I'm gonna bring them down. Now this morphed into a democracy movement, but as you know in Egypt, we swapped out uh, Mubarak. We brought in, elected the Muslim Brotherhood. They couldn't impact the price of food. They have no control over it. This is a global, this is a global issue. And so in very short order, we got, the Egyptians got bored with them and threw them out and the military came back in, but the military has no ability to, to, to impact this, right? This is actually the problem that we're facing. The problem that we're facing is not that the price of gasoline is $4 a gallon. The, the problem is that wheat is $12 a bushel. So the real issue is not the price of gasoline, it's the affordability of food. And this is a significant impact on us, right? I know I told you that only six to seven percent of your income goes to food, and if it price doubles, that's 12 percent. That, that's not the reason it impacts us. It impacts us because if we don't take care of the bottom two billion people on the planet, right, they will take care of us, okay? Now, many people have said, and if you can read, I, I guarantee you, you can go today and you will find a headline that says, the price of oil is going to go back to twenty dollars a barrel because fracking has saved us, and there's an unlimited supply of oil and we don't have to worry about it anymore, okay? 
Fracking is old technology applied to old oil fields where the price of $100 a barrel oil allowed that expensive technology to be used. This has nothing to do with new discoveries. If you want to look at new discoveries, these are discoveries of new oil fields hit a 50-year low in 2013 and 2014. $2.4 trillion with a T was spent in oil exploration over those last two years. And during that time, 14 billion barrels of new oil were discovered in 2013, 16 billion barrels in 2014. So you can look at these numbers and say, hey, wait a minute, that's 30 billion barrels of oil. That's got to last us 100 years, OK? We burned 56 billion barrels of oil in that same time frame, right? As a friend of mine says, do the math, OK? The price of oil and the price of food is going to go up, right? We've temporarily oversupplied the market because Americans do what they do so well, which is when we develop a new technology, we will run that thing into the ground, right? And that's what, and that's what fracking is. OK, uh, but, but I want to be optimistic about some things as well. And I'm going to tell you about algae, and I'm very optimistic about that and how it's going to impact this. But, but here's the other thing. You know, in, in, in biology, data is no longer rate limiting, right? What does that mean? That means we can now sequence genomes so cheap. You know, here's the price of a genome just 15 years ago, $10,000 for a million base pairs. And that was going down. You know, we have the equivalent of the biological Moore's Law, where the price of that was going down over time. And then what happened in 2007, we found a new way to sequence thing using, using biology rather than chemistry. This was all chemistry-based. We found out biology is even cheaper, and we drove that price down to nothing. We now have enormous databases of every genome on the planet. And what does that mean? That means we have a beautiful treasure chest full of traits that we can now exploit. The other thing is that computing power is going to go infinite sometime within the next decade. What does that mean? We're going to actually have computers today that are so smart, they can design the next generation of computers. And that means computing power and genomic information are not rate limiting anymore for any discovery, for any invention we want to make. What is imagination and manufacturing? Those things are certainly rate limiting. But here's actually the big one. It's deployment. Right? And shockingly to me, this is rate limiting because of human social acceptance of technology. Not because it improves things, not because it isn't more efficient. It is all those things. People don't accept it, I, which this one just kind of floors me. But having said that, right, I don't accept all new technologies myself. It took me a long time before I got my iPhone, right? All right, so what does all this mean? And I apologize for making this in a big list, but I couldn't think of any cool pictures to go with this, all right? So it turns out fossil fuels really are finite. Huh, who knew? Well, everybody on the planet should have. We just refused to accept this. As food and fuel are directly linked, if we really, and this is really not fracking, if we really fix energy, we'll fix food, all right? That's all we have to do. We just have to, you know, if, if we can just get unlimited energy, everything else is good. The problem is we cannot fix energy quickly. This is going to take decades for us to fix. We've known about this problem. Every president, the last five presidents, you've all heard this, you know, knew that energy was a big deal, and we never fixed it. We simply didn't bite the bullet, pay our dues, and do what it required to really do it. But I think we can improve food security immediately, and then we'll have a chance to fix energy in the long haul. Here's what I said before. If we don't fix the problem, which is food, for the bottom two billion people, they're going to cause problems. I am convinced that this is what the Islamic State and ISIS is. This is what pirates in Somalia are, right? This is not, you know, it's, it's OK, we have a convenient excuse you know, of religion to fight other religious groups. But what it really is is I can't feed my family, and I don't have opportunity going forward. It must be your fault, all right? So if we fix this for them, it's completely to our benefit, all right? Here's the other thing. We're going to do things different in the future, right? The question is how. And that brings up one of my favorite quotes, which actually came from one of the vice presidents of Exxon. I asked him what he was worried about. You know, peak oil, uh, you know, climate change, what? And he said, well, all those things are really important, but what really worries me is that people only operate under two modes. They do nothing, and then they overreact. And he goes, right now we're in the do nothing phase, and when they overreact, they're going to blame me because they always do. All right? But this is a serious problem that we have, that we can't look forward and say, we see what our problems are, we see that they're coming, Let's address them right now. It's like, well, we don't really have to address them today. We can wait another day, all right? 
So it's going to be done different. We're just not sure how yet. The rate of scientific discovery today is extremely fast and accelerating. So as I said, that's an enormous opportunity. But so we're not limited by this. We're not limited by scientific discovery. We're limited by deployment. So actually, in the organized research unit that, that I run, which is called Food and Fuel for the 21st Century, we actually have economists and social scientists embedded in that. Because what we realize is we make a great invention and it doesn't get deployed, it's not really worth very much. Okay? Here's another great one. Everyone likes progress, but no one likes change. Right? Meaning we all want things to get better, but we don't want to do something different, and we have to do something different in the future. All right? And then here's one of this used to be my favorite bumper sticker think globally, act locally. You know, I never really knew what that meant, but what I think it really means is, you know, you can think big, but the devil is in the detail. Or another way to put it is, if we solve enough little problems, we will solve the big ones, okay? So now I'm really going to shrink this down and tell you some of the little problems that we try to solve, all right? So some of those could be enormously big. They could be oil, and eventually we'll get to that. But where we're going to start out down here is by making very high-value products, but very small volumes, Right? And we're going to set up the industry. So we're going to take these little biomanufacturing guys. We're going to take sunlight and CO2 inside a little bio machine right here. And we're going to make lipids and carbohydrates and proteins. And lipids could eventually be, be fuel. Carbohydrates can eventually be food. Protein can be food. But protein can also be high value products. And I think if we make the high value products first and actually get these things deployed, we'll start to get the social acceptance for these things. We'll start to get efficiency increases. And then eventually, we will get to solving our big problem, which is energy. So why are we going to use algae to do that, right? And what is algae? Algae is really simple. It's an aquatic organism that has chlorophyll and other pigments and carries out photosynthesis. So in other words, it's a little photosynthetic machine, but it's in a place we haven't done it before. So this is not going to compete with agriculture. And I think that's essential, because I don't think we can take our agricultural plants, corn, rice, and wheat, and turn those into energy, turn those into fuel. So why do we think about this? Productivity is front and center, and I'll show you a couple lines on that. They're actually the most efficient little machines on the planet at turning sunlight and CO2 into products. Scalable, we have to go to an enormous scale. 1.2 trillion gallons of petroleum are consumed worldwide every year. About a quarter of those here in this country, about 300 billion gallons. Sustainable, meaning we can't compete with food and we can't use up all of our potable water. And then programmable, and I'll talk a little bit about that. What that means is we now have an opportunity because of our genomic data, because of computational power, because of our imagination, we can actually program these little guys to make anything we want, all right? You can measure productivity in a lot of different ways. Here's just two really easy ways to measure it, which is tons per acre per year. So sugarcane out there, many people will know, is the most productive plant on the planet. You can get about 25 tons per acre. Algae, we're already at 50, all right? There's no secret for that. Once you get into water, you can increase CO2 concentration. And when you increase CO2 concentration, you drive photosynthesis much faster. These guys have twice the photosynthetic ability of plants, not because they have different photosynthesis, but simply we can change the concentration. Right? You can also measure this in terms of oil yield. And in algae, we can hit 20 to 40 percent oil. So that's very nice. Oil goes directly into fuel. And so if we put that in gallons per acre per year, we think we can hit 5,000. Right now, we're at about 2,500. So what does that mean? If we could get to 5,000 gallons per acre per year times 40 million acres, we would be making all of our gasoline and diesel. So then you ask, well, what's 40 million acres? Is that half the United States? Right? Is that San Diego? What is that? 40 million acres turns out to be exactly 40% of the corn crop. So if we took that 40% of the corn crop that we turn into ethanol and blend with our fuel right now and converted it from corn to algae, we'd go from 14 billion gallons to 200 billion gallons, right? Corn requires about 36 inches of water per year. Algae requires less than 30, and it doesn't have to be fresh water, all right? So we could do this right now, all right? Some people say, yeah, but that's kooky. Algae's kooky. It's in my bird bath. I try to kill it. It's actually about a $10 billion industry worldwide. All right? People in every other country except ours grow this stuff. They eat it. They make products out of it. We actually grow it here. There's actually a big farm out in Imperial Valley, but they grow a very high value uh, algae called spirulina that they put into the little green shakes that you see at the supermarket called super blue green. Okay? But we do this stuff. It's actually out there. Okay, how do you do that? These are pictures from my lab. So you grow algae up. I'll show you a picture of the big ponds later, but you grow algae up. 
You harvest it, that's just thick algae paste. You separate the oil from the proteins. The protein and the carbohydrate can become food. You concentrate this stuff, and crude oil can go directly into existing oil refineries to produce drop-in fuel, all right? And this has already been done. A company that I'm a founder of called Sapphire, they have a little car. Uh, it's called the Algeus. That's half algae, half Prius. Some people call it the Algesus because somehow they have a religious belief that this is gonna save us, but it's not. It's half algae, half Prius. This thing drives around San Diego. They've flown uh, jet airplanes on it. And then one of the other companies, and I'll tell you about them also in a second, Solazyme up in the Bay Area, they actually made uh, diesel fuel from algae, gave it to the Navy, and the Navy right out here in San Diego a couple years ago drove their destroyers and their amphibious planes with it. So this is all doable. It, it already works right now. Why aren't we there yet? We're not there yet because it's still a little bit too expensive. All right? This is a calculation that we made several years ago. At that time in 2009, we guessed we were at about 21 bucks a, a gallon for oil. We said by bioprospecting, by molecular engineering, by breeding, by all of these things, eventually down to co-products, this is an important one, we're gonna drive the price down. We were doing really well up in here till about 2014. By 2014, we got down to about seven or eight dollars a gallon. And then as all of you know, the price of petroleum dropped. It went from 100 bucks a barrel down to 50 bucks a barrel. And what happens when you do that is investors simply will not put money into biofuels anymore, okay? So when the price of oil comes back up, the reinvestment will come back into biofuels. But in the meantime, there are many things that we can do that will keep this line driving forward, driving down by increasing the technology and by increasing deployment. So let me just tell you about the three things that we have to do. The first one is we have to do something called domestication. The algae that we use right now are wild type algae that we sort of went out and collected from the ponds and gutters, right? And there is no industrial you know, operation out there now, no agricultural operation that works on wild type plants. All of these things have been domesticated. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is Tiacente. This is what corn looked like 7,000 years ago. And by selective breeding and selection, we turn this thing into this, okay? Yields have gone up enormously. Just in the last 80 years, yields of corn have gone up eightfold, 800%. That process is domestication, okay? We need to do the same thing for algae. We also need to get to agricultural scale, right? When you get to ag scale, then you get the economies of scale. This is a picture of the Sapphire Energy production site down in Columbus, New Mexico. That's about a third of a mile wide by almost a mile long. This is 100 acres, which puts out about 100 barrels of oil per day. All right, but these guys, I will also tell you, are right now converting this to make high value products out of that because they simply cannot survive attempting to make fuel. And then the last thing we need to do is make co-products. So what are co-products? This is one of my favorite ones, you know. In, in pigs, the expression in agriculture is a farmer sells everything in a pig but the oink, right? And by that, what that means is if you don't monetize every aspect of that, you're, you're, you're not gonna stay in business long. And we have to do the same thing with algae. But what I will say is the gap between today and economic fuel is not gonna be taken in one leap. We cannot jump to the commercial scale, right? We will not, we, we simply will not get the investment, right? From either in the investment community or governments. But I think if we go to high value products, we will. And so I'm gonna tell you just two stories now quickly on some of the high value products that we make. This is actually not a high value product, but this simply shows domestication of algae. So what we did was we took fluorescent proteins, and by molecular engineering, we targeted those to different parts of the cell. So we put a red uh, cherry protein into the endoplasmic reticulum. We put a blue protein into the nucleus. We cross these two guys together. We get a beautiful little guy like this, which you can't see is the outline of the algae right here. We put in a green protein into the mitochondria, cross those guys together, you get that fantastic thing. Our little algae swim and they have flagella, so we fused a blue protein with that, and then cross that, and here's what we end up with, these beautiful little rainbow-colored algae that can swim around. So why is that really important? I, you know, it's not important because this is a high-value product, although I'm convinced if these guys were bigger, I could sell them on late-night TV and compete with the Chia Pets, but they're not, they're too small. But I think if you can make rainbow-colored algae, you can make anything, all right? And so now I'm gonna tell you just a couple of the proteins that we actually make that we think will be economically viable. So colostrum is produced by all mammals and contains highly active orally available proteins. The really interesting thing about colostrum is whether you are a mouse or a human or a pig or a blue whale, you make about the same 20 proteins. As uh, you know, a biologist, I say I never fight evolution. 
right? If 65 years of evolution conserved those proteins in all mammals, then they must be really important, and I'm going to make them and find out what they do. And it turns out that they do a couple of really interesting things. So all infants that are on human breast milk do not get colds or the flu for the first several months of their life. That is because of these proteins right here. So we simply went back and asked, could we make these proteins an algae? And this is a stain gel showing one of those proteins called mammary-associated amyloid. It accumulates to very high levels. And then we went and test these in pigs. We actually fed these to pigs, right, who'd been weaned from their mother. So we fed them algae that contained that ma protein. And then we asked if we challenged these pigs with a bacteria that normally caused diarrhea, what happens? And what we found out was that those that didn't get the ma algae, 100% of them got diarrhea, those that did, 60% reduction in that, and even the ones that did, of this 40% that got it, they had much fewer days of that, all right? So this is really nice. So, so what does this tell you? you know, number one, it tells you you have a happy pig, but the main thing that it tells you is prevention and reduction of diarrhea. There are five million children killed every year from bacterial and viral diarrhea. The number one killer of kids, it's not malaria, it's not starvation, it's dehydration from diarrhea. So this is now actually funded by the Gates Foundation to see if we can take this and push this a little farther on, okay? We made it, we, one of the other proteins, this guy's a totally cool one, this one's called osteopontin. So osteopontin, it's a bone protein, but it's actually delivered to infants in colostrum. We could make it, it's important that it has phosphates on it, turns out in algae, those phosphates are put on. This beautifully activates the immune system. I won't go into the detail of how this, but, but this activates the immune system. Why is that important? That's important because there's a product called Airborne. Please, no one put their hand up and say they take this. <laughs> this product sells for a billion dollars a year, and what is it? It's vitamin C. There is zero evidence that vitamin C does anything for your immune system. If you had a vitamin C deficiency, it would help you, but it doesn't do anything beyond that. Osteopontin does. That's a billion dollar drug. But then the most amazing thing is we actually went back and looked at human baby formula. And as I told you, these proteins are conserved across all mammals, but human formula comes from cow's milk. And cows, unlike humans, deliver all their colostrum proteins in the first two days, where humans spread them out over five or six months. So if you look at baby formula, here's the amount of these proteins, here's five of them that we make, six of them that we make. This is the amount that's found in human breast milk. This is the amount that's found in baby formula, right? So many of you will know that studies have recently come out that says if your child is breastfed, they will have a higher IQ, they will have greater earning potential throughout their lives, they will have better health and better health outcomes, they'll live longer, now, some people have argued, well, sure, but that's because kids who are breastfed by their mom are probably rich kids. That's not true. This is, this is across all economic strata. So I think it is because of these proteins. Unfortunately, I've convinced some investors that we should try this, and we should get these things made in algae so, so that we can put them into baby formula so we can make smart kids in America and the rest of the world. Okay, so... I'm going to end on one last note, which is, okay, so what have I told you so far? So I, I, I've told you that my little algae is eventually going to feed the world. It's going to make all the fuel we ever want, and it's going to make American kids much smarter than they are today. And I know what some of you are thinking, <laughs> right? You're thinking, really? I came all the way down here this morning, and that's all you've got? So of course it's not all I've got. I would never end on, on a low note like that. As I told you, petroleum comes from algae, all right? And that means anything you can make from petroleum, you can eventually make from algae. So petroleum is simply fossil algae. And that means anything you can make from that, you can make from algae. So we knew that one of the plastics that can be made from algae oil is called polyurethane. So if you start with algae oil and you do an epoxidation and a ring opening and et cetera, you can eventually make polyurethane. What does polyurethane give you? Polyurethane gives you surfboards. So this is the world's first algae blank that we made about uh, three weeks ago now. We shaped it into a surfboard, and two weeks ago we presented it to the mayor of San Diego. And this little guy is out touring the world. Okay, he was in Washington, D.C. Uh, two weeks ago, he was in London last week, and he's on his way to Tokyo, but he has a brother.
So this is his little brother. Uh, he was actually made the same day, so they're twins. The entire inside of this is made from algae oil, all right? It's glassed actually by, a, by also a sustainable uh, resin, but that resin comes from a plant-based product. So what, what does that say in the end? And how are we really gonna change the world, right? You know, many people have said, oh, you know, this is kind of trivial, you made a surfboard. I've gotten more press off this little guy. He's gonna have to have his own agent. But I think <laughs> the important thing that it does is it shows our students and it shows the world that with a little bit of imagination and a little bit of creativity and a little bit of hard work, you can make anything. We're gonna start with things like this, but then eventually we're gonna make medicine, we're gonna make food, and one day we're gonna make fuel. And so with that, I, I think I'll, I'll end it there. So we're gonna make all of these different products, and, uh, and, and I'm simply gonna say, I'm gonna end just on this one last note, which is, there is one thing that we have to do. In, in addition to using you know, our sort of imagination and getting these products made, one really important thing we have to do is we all have to become more efficient at the way we live, right? And that means we have to consume less. Many of you will know that we're 5% of the world's population in the United States, and we consume 25% of their energy and 25% of their goods. This is one of my favorite slides, and I show this to the students in my class all the time. And what this is, believe it or not, you can measure happiness and well-being in people. The social scientists tell me it's true. You really can do this, okay? And if you plot happiness against gross domestic product or how rich you are, what you find out is that if you're poor, you're not very happy, okay? That shouldn't be too much of a surprise. You're not eating. You don't have a house. But it doesn't take very much money to get pretty high up on the happiness index. So here's Qatar, one of the richest countries in the world. Here's El Salvador, one of the poorest countries in the world. These guys use one-fifth of the energy, have one-fifth of the economy, yet they're just as happy, all right? And what that means is we consume a lot less. We can consume a lot less and still be just as happy. And that's what we're going to have to face in the future, right? That happiness isn't a brand-new 6,000-pound car. It's an 8-pound surfboard, all right? And I'll leave it there, and thank you very much. No, I already know what you're going to ask. No, you cannot borrow the board. I know I saw the waves out there, but it's not going out. So uh, we've got time for a couple of quick questions. Um, uh, Malin. Uh, what is the potential future volume of algae grown in freshwater versus saltwater? Yeah, so certainly if we're, so all of the things that I make right now, which are high value products, I make those in freshwater because they're uh, very low quantities and because the algae I work on is a freshwater one. Sapphire Energy site that I showed, that's in brackish water, about 50 millimolar sodium chloride. Salt water is about four to 500, but there are marine algae that grow in marine waters, no problem at all. They're just as productive. So certainly when we get to the very large volume things like food and fuel, 100% is gonna be made in marine systems with marine water, but probably not in open ocean, right? We have to get containment, so it'll probably be shallow bays, you know, close to the coast that we can flood with, with ocean water. I was just wondering if uh, Tesla Energy uh, impacts your calculus at all. Yeah, so, well, it, it directly impacts me because I bought an electric car and have photovoltaics on my house, and I'm waiting for my little Tesla batteries to show up. I did not get a Tesla, I got a Ford. I'm a UC faculty, not Stanford, so, you know. <laughs> So, um, so, so certainly every single thing that we can use that reduces our carbon footprint and makes us more energy efficient is fantastic. You know, the, the sad calculations are that we simply do not have enough lithium on the planet for all of us to drive lithium powered cars, right, battery cars. But that doesn't mean that those of us who can afford them shouldn't get them now, right? Uh, one of the expressions that, that, I, that I hear said a lot, but I think it has some truth, is, you know, we're never going to solve any of these problems with a silver bullet, but we might do it with silver buckshot, meaning that lots of little solutions will add up to a solution on energy. So electric cars, maybe they get to 5%, maybe to 7% of the cars we have on this planet. Hey, but that's 7% better than we are now. And then if algae fuel can add another 10% on top of that, then we're at 17. You know, you, you just add up a lot of little things to a big solution. Okay. Um, as an industry, we have spent billions of dollars on algae projects, and the challenge has been scalability. So what are your thoughts on that? 
You know, I, I think one of the biggest problems we had was that people assumed that we were going to jump from where we are now, which is very small, to being world scale in one jump. And no industry has ever done that, right? If you looked at the first cell phones, they were big and clunky and only a few people could afford them to what we have today that are ubiquitous. And in fact, when I was in China, I noticed that in China now, everybody has two cell phones. One isn't even enough to keep up with social media and your friends, right? So I think what we have to do is build slowly on this. We're going to start with, with smaller, high-value production. And, and when we're successful with that, we're going to expand. And then we're going to leapfrog our way up there. And I think that's the way every industry has been built. So th this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, really. OK? One last question. How did these, um, these ups and downs in the oil price, like the one that we had last winter, how do they affect your ability to raise money and confidence and what you're doing. So, so enormously, and that's the expression that I had, which is we, we do nothing and then overreact, right? It's not that we didn't know that we were running out of fossil fuel. We've known this for 40 or 50 years, right? We, we had peak oil production in this country in 1975, and Huber put his prediction up in the 1950s, all right? And yet our response was, yeah, but it's not a problem today. So I'm not going to worry about it. Then when the price of oil spiked in 2007, what happened? You know, venture capitalists and the government flooded us with money. And from 2007 to 2010, we had huge resources. And then they all disappeared, right? And today, you couldn't go and start a, a bioenergy company for, for, for anything, all right? So why is it that, that as human beings, we can't see a problem many years in the future and invest toward it now? I don't understand. And even my friends in social science don't understand it. It's simply one of the illogical things that we have to put up with. But, but it enormously impacts us. And that's why I've gone to all high value products, right? If, if, so I make anti-cancer drugs, and they work really well. And so if I can get venture guys to invest in that, and I can keep the technology going with that, and if I can make surfboards and keep the technology going, then what I hope is in four or five years, when we panic again, when the price of oil is back to $130 or $140 a gallon, I will be able to say, OK, I got you covered. Right? Rather than can all that technology, we kept it going, we kept developing. You know, we, we sort of tricked people you know, in, in, into getting high value products, not knowing that they were helping us build a fuel and food industry. But, but that's been my approach. And I think it'll, I think it'll work. Right? So thank you all.